Hey guys, welcome to Hunt Shoot Off Road and we've got another conversation with episode two and today we're having a conversation with a dog trapper. So I'd like to welcome to the conversation, Chris, how are you mate? Good mate, how are you? I'm fantastic. So you've got a YouTube channel as well, it's, it's, a, it's a dog's life. That's Hopefully correct, yeah. You know, yeah, it looks good. We get that in the screen there. So. Yeah, it looks good. And... Um, and you also run a, uh, a commercial or professional trapping and dog shooting business as well, don't you? Yes, mate. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, been running one by myself now for about three and a half years. Before that, I was with a um, partner in crime, Treno, as you might see on the videos. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Treno and I started um, the business oh, probably nearly 10 years ago now, I suppose. And um, just sort of went on from there and then eventually sort of um, things come up where I had to move over this way and he sort of runs his business over there and then on bigger contracts we'll join up and work together. Yeah, awesome. Mate, yeah. I do like, you seem to have like a mad little uh, vlogger set up there as well with your little fire in the oh, background. Yeah. It's quite trendy. I thought it'd be pretty cool, but it's bloody hot. I'm sweating here. <laughs> <laughs> you might have to bloody jumper off. Yeah, yeah, bloody yeah. It's it's uh going pretty well. I just got some new wood on the weekend, so I so well. like so I went out to my dad's and we uh, he he chopped me some wood, got this uh iron bark stuff, so Yeah, um, cool. It should go pretty good over winter. Cook a few marshmallows and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a pizza oven actually we built that. It's out of an old um it's an old oil drum, you know the oil drums that you used to have on the back of the houses? to run the old oil heaters. Oh, no, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, so it, we got them at a farm clearance sale as an oil, oil heater. I wanted to build a pizza oven, um, and I thought that'd look pretty cool. So yeah, we cut the, the bottom, the top out of it and made that into a door, and then uh, put a flue on it and put some heat bricks in the bottom. She's cool, works well. Awesome, fine. nice going. Yeah. yeah. And so I I, um, I stumbled across your channel only like, like a week ago, I just was, um, I, I've just started trapping myself. Okay. When I say I've just started trapping, I bought my first three traps and I did a, done a fair bit of research. Now I've been out, done a little bit of trapping with a, another guy, one of my dad's friends. And uh, he's, he traps locally at sort of a, you know, within an hour of Brisbane. So he's, he's working quite close. He, he just does it for the, the love of it, for the fun. Yeah. And, uh, I learned a bit off of him and, spoken with another guy went out shooting in a place out at Burke and he he was full on into he's he was saying he shot something like 67 dogs in the 11 years that he's been on the block and he hates them it's like his passion to shoot dogs and yeah right. and all that sort of stuff like that and so I just was doing a bit of research to try and see and learn what I needed to do to make some changes and you you just popped up in my feed and I was like yeah watch this and mate cool. what an entertaining video it was just uh I don't want to ruin it for anyone. I did I did share it on my, my YouTube channel there because it was was really good. But, you know, you, you're doing a fair bit of trapping and you, you do a little bit of educational stuff there. And, and, of course, there's a couple of funny stuff that happens when people go out on their hunting trips and whatnot. Um, mm. You know, I saw Treno dared you to uh, ride the uh, piping hot quad bike, oh, black yeah, seat, yeah, thing yeah, sitting yeah. in the sun. And, yeah, it uh, took me a while to get over that. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually quite hot. I didn't think it would be that hot, but it was... Uh, sitting in the sun for a while so yeah it was quite hot but um yeah no we we just try and have a bit of fun while we're out there there is a little bit of downtime as you probably know now after you sort of check your traps there is a little bit of downtime before you know the afternoons we try and go for a bit of a howl in the afternoons as well um so between between check, checking our traps and going for a bit of a howl there's sort of a little bit of downtime so we always have a bit of fun go for a swim or something but um, yeah, the idea of the videos just sort of come up. I, for some reason, when we were first starting out, I always wanted had this idea that I'd start a magazine. And I said to Treno, I'm going to start, you know, a magazine and talk to other trappers and things around the place and put little stories in there and stuff and call it It's a Dogger's Life. And then, um, you know, we, of course, that never event eventuated because you just get so busy with everything else, trying to, you know, promote your business, trying to drum more business up, trying to do do your work as well. So it's a sort of all 
got left behind. And then eventually when I thought, bugger it, I'll start recording a few, you know, a bit of what we do and um, start putting it out there and just seeing how it goes, you know. So that's how it all started. It is, it is a, just a bit of fun. It's a bit of a hobby for me. Like I just like the idea of being able to share what we do and try and sort of share our knowledge without, you know, having formal videos, so to speak, where you just sit there and say, this is how you do this, this is how you do this. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and those videos, they, they sort of already exist. I think um, Pest yeah. Smart got some pretty good videos there for like specific trapping things and that. So, I mean, and it's funny, I've spoken to a lot of people and a lot of people will refer you to to those videos. Like I know Western yeah. Trapping Supplies, they'll tell you to go there. It's one of their first point of calls. And yeah. a few of those other mates that I that I spoke about, they'll say that, you know, they're pretty good videos. But, um, you know, it's not too bad because they've been done by a few different people. So that's, um, so you get a few different, um, you know, methods and, and all that sort of stuff. So that's, that's not too bad, but, they're just, they're a bit dry, you know, they're not entertaining, yeah. which was what really, um, you know, I thought that that's pretty good. But um, it's interesting that you said that you wanted to start a magazine because I guess, um, you know, magazines really are dead now and it's um, even DVDs are gone by the wayside. So well, that's sort of why I started my blog was a similar thing because I wanted to sort of um, publish some content that I thought was, you know, there's a bit of a void in that market. And um, yeah. And so I did a similar thing. And then of course I just slowly moved over to YouTube and it's funny. My, I enjoy making the videos. I enjoy making the content, but I hate editing. And I hate yeah, it, right. but I actually probably get nearly more traffic through my blog and I don't really even attend to it. So it's kind of, but I hate writing. So yeah. it's one of those things where that, you know, you just try and do what you love, not what you hate because otherwise you just don't do anything. So. Yeah, exactly. And it's finding the time too, because as you know, it, it all takes a lot of time, you know, especially for us, we sort of, when we're out there, we're actually physically getting paid to be out there as well. So the last thing we want to do is miss out on some dogs that we could have got because I was there filming or something like that, you know, um, yeah, that's or, right. or miss a set of tracks or something like that. So it's very hard at the moment to sort of, get enough footage to make a bit of a video about it as well as do your job. And then, you know, it's almost like I need a full-time cameraman with me, you know, <laughs> just follow, because there's so much stuff that you miss out on too, because you like, I physically, you know, just carry my phone around and, and film off my phone. So it's, you know, you'll be doing something and you think, Oh geez, that would have been funny. I wish I'd have been filming. And then you'll be filming and you'll be like, this is going to be boring, you know? That's right. Yeah, you'd almost just got to wear the GoPro and just have it cooking yeah. the whole time. Otherwise, you, yeah, it's yeah. really hard. But it's funny you say that because I probably, my best videos have actually been filmed on the on the phone, not yeah. on the, like I've got a DLSR camera up the top here and, and uh, that's what I do most of my recording with my, um, you know, my reloading stuff and all that sort of stuff like that. But, man, it takes so much time to set up and you've got to get the lighting right. It's just, I just yeah. find... I have more fun just filming on the phone. Like if I just get the phone out, it's just like, boom, start recording and it's like done and dusted. And then I just rip it off there later. So yeah, yeah. You know, it's on auto and it's like, if I don't get it on the phone, it's more likely I just won't get anything at all anyway. So, That's right. and so are you, are you trapping full time or this is a, a bit of a side gig for you? Yeah, no. So I, um, at the moment, so for the last three and a half years, I've been working for the Morton Bay Regional Council. So I do full-time um, trapping pest animal management for them. Um, and then, yeah, as I said, on the bigger contracts, I'll still go out west and do those bigger ones with Trent. Um, so, yeah, basically here we're looking after all the pest management. So um, responding to customer requests. So the, the general public will ring up with a, a complaint about a dog or being attacked by a wild dog or feral pigs digging up their garden or something like that. And then so we'll respond with whatever sort of management we can. I guess um, that interesting question would be how how close into the city are these events occurring? Like, are they much closer in than people would imagine? Or Yeah, absolutely, mate. Like, we get um, wild dogs all through, through this whole region. So our region runs from um, basically camp... Uh, um, just south of Sanford, so yep. so uh, you know there's there's sort of a line from Sanford. I think it goes down to like Strathpine, um, then across to the obviously the coast, 
and then out to um, Mount Glorious and then right up to, sort of just south, um, east of Kilcoy and then obviously back to the coast down there. But So we get wild dogs throughout the whole region. So there's wild dogs running, you know, through just out the back of Strathpine, um, um, Sanford, you know, all through that area. Well, I, I did watch, I watched a video on YouTube actually they're talking about um, tracking wild dogs and they, they put a tracker on this wild dog that they caught and it was all but living in suburbia and it was yeah. just like, just living in like the equivalent of, uh, you know, Tui Forest, which is in Brisbane. And it was yeah. just like going around and, and they were like, how, how can this dog be so active and no one knows? And basically they just come to the conclusion that people don't realise it's wild. They just think it's someone's pet running around on the street. They go, oh, there's that dog again coming yeah. down, you know, running down the street and that no one thinks much of it. People throw up food even almost to that yeah. point. So Yeah, and that, and that's that's a big problem here as well. Like people just don't understand the damage that they can do, you know. And yeah. um, they sort of in a little bit tend to harbour the dogs because they are feeding them and, you know, um, trying to protect them. And they just don't understand that's the biggest issue um with that sort of situation but yeah they, they're definitely there um you know anywhere as i explain to people anywhere that there's they leave um, wildlife corridors there's obviously wildlife and with wildlife unfortunately you, you've got the predators so you've got foxes and and wild dogs following those uh the wild, native wildlife around yeah of course mm. All right. Well, let's 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 get into some of the more exciting things to do with um, with trapping. Now, now yeah. we will cover a bit of trapping and a bit of shooting because I, you know, because I'm into both. And yeah. uh, what what are the seasons like? What's the cycle that these are going through? Can you do this all year round, or is it just, you know, you you can only sort of go leading up to breeding season, or like how? Which I know what's interesting is it, it uh, does quite it aligns with the um, the deer rut, I believe the um, the breeding season, yeah. The breeding season, but can yeah. you can you hunt them all year round, or is it like just six months of the year? No, you can you can sort of hunt or trap um, dogs most of the year round. Um, during the breeding season is actually the best time to hunt them, as far as um, calling them and things like that, because you'll get a lot more response during the breeding season. So the <clears throat> the um, breeding season's changed quite a bit over the years just with the influence of domestic dog in the in the bloodline so the old um you know dingo breeding season used to sort of run about now so the old timers used to always say it was it started or it was it was sort of started around easter and then it had sort of run out um sort of three months after that the actual dingo breeding season well that's um, the cycle i've been pretty much told that sort of they start on uh, in about April, and then they yeah. move, you know, and they'll drop their pups. I think in about June or something like that. Yeah. Is what I've been sort of alluded to. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's sort of the the general, you know, um, as I said, typical dingo bloodline breeding season. But we've found, you know, over the years that that's sort of lengthened quite a bit. You know, a couple of months either side of that as well, where we're getting dogs breeding a lot earlier in the year, and then obviously a lot later in the year as well. And is that is that dependent on weather a little bit as well? Does that does that fluctuate um, that? I don't think it's as much weather as it is is as it is, um, you know, as I said, the influence of the domestic dog breed, but also the food um, availability of food. Um, you know, like your domestic dogs, if they're doing well in a good good condition and you're looking after them, they'll come in season nearly all year round. Um, yeah. And so I'm, we're finding that the wild dogs, if they're in a good, you know, an easy food source location, they'll sort of come into season quite a, quite a, for quite a long time. So they're having pups for a lot longer, which is sort of changing the dynamics of things quite a bit. Yeah, but um, yeah, let's go back to your original question. You can sort of hunt and trap dogs most of the year now um, without any problems. So they but they, vary. sorry, mate. So um, I guess if you're hunting all year round, is there different methods that you use throughout the season? Um, say, say, let's talk about shooting. What's methods that you would use for shooting all year round versus the methods you would maybe use for trapping all year round? 
yeah so the as far as shooting goes yeah as i said i try and sort of concentrate my shooting or calling dogs during this time of year so um i I spent a lot of time with an old fellow called Les Keys, who is down in Auburn Elbow sort of region. And he okay. grew up around that area calling dogs, him and his old mate Crockett, um, who they, you know, went to primary school together at, at Old Duck Creek or something like that it's called, which is um, near Auburn Elbow in northern New South Wales. So he always used to tell me that the best time to call dogs is the first full moon after Easter. So I sort of concentrate my time when I'm hunting dogs as far as calling them in, in those times. Um, the other well, times I think that's, year, the, that's the equinox or something, I think, isn't it? The that yeah. first full moon near Easter? Maybe. I'm not sure. I'd have to look into that. That yeah. would be interesting to know because then that would probably have some kind of meaning, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, definitely um, most animals, as you probably know, will sort of work work off full moons, you know, so we find that dogs will be traveling around a lot more a week before and a week after the full moon um, is when you'll get the most action um, and attacks and things like that. So that might have something to do with it as well. So, but um, yeah, so as far as that, and then obviously later on in the year, you've got a lot more sort of coming up around Christmas time. You've got younger dogs on the ground. So you can sort of concentrate calling then as well, because those younger dogs will come out to a call quite easily. Uh, okay, so although you're hunting all year round, your the target animal is a different animal. Yes. So you're hunting and the younger juvenile pups and teenagers or whatever you want to call them, that type of thing. Yeah, yeah. Because they're a bit dumber. Yeah, yeah. They, they they just haven't had the association with humans yet, you know, so they're a lot more curious and things like that. Um, yeah, okay. <clears throat> whereas the... The older dogs during this time of year are nearly very similar to a younger dog because they've got one thing on their mind, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> so they, you yeah. know, they will come out a lot easier this time of year than the other times of year as well to a call. Yeah. Well, that probably um, probably leans towards one of the things I was. I've heard that you can get a dog on heat. You just chain it to a tree, and uh, it'll bring wild dogs in from all over town. Yeah. Is yeah. That not as good as it it's alluded to be, or it can be that good. Oh, it is, mate. A, a wild dog in heat, yeah, will bring male dogs for miles. Um, like we, we, excuse me, often use a, a dog with us when we're trapping. So we use it as a scent dog. So we'll take it with us, you know, and let her walk along a trail and mark out where other dogs have obviously been. She'll sort of go along and mark those areas. Yeah. So our success rate is like a lot higher when she's in season so she'll go along being in season and mark those areas as well um, oh and obviously that that uh in heat urine is like super potent for those dogs to yeah, really want to yeah. Come in on. it's just got a um yeah obviously a, a natural there's natural hormones um, in it or hormones whatever. into it that'll bring them in um and they'll come for miles they'll be able to smell it for miles um i think for I, I'm not a hundred percent sure on the science of this, but uh, once again, I just sort of go off what I've sort of experienced and what I've been told over the years. But that actual hormone that, that is in a in a bitch in heat actually only lasts in a urine for about twelve hours, and then it and then it subsides. subsides. So then, um, you know, a lot of people think, well, I'll keep that urine and use it from then on, sort of thing. But that urine just turns into normal bitch, bitch, bitch urine after about 12 hours uh, okay like so, so the, the potency of it like really deteriorates so the half-life of it's like really quick or whatever or something yeah 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 and the old fellas that sort of explained this to me said it's sort of because that's nature if if you know if you imagine a, a male dog chasing after a female dog as she's urinating as she's traveling along if she urinates in one one area then moves on and that scent and that hormone stays there, that male dog will just stay there. He won't be able to find track her, you know? So Yeah, that's okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or or every dog for the next hundred kilometers is gonna come in on it. Yeah, one spot. yeah that's right. Yeah. So that yeah. sort of makes sense, I guess, to some degree. Yeah, it does, yeah. Yeah. So but you hear that a lot, you know, the, um, the and that is the best lure you could ever get. 
Okay, well that's well that's what I sort of heard. I think from a couple of videos I've watched and all that sort of stuff like that. And yeah, yeah. Well, as far as as far as tying them to the tree, though, that's you know that sort of we really try and stay on the ethical side of things, even though what we do is quite controversial. The last thing you want to do is try and um, you know give the people that don't understand more ammunition. So well, and I guess you are at some degree you're putting your own animal at risk. Um, oh, absolutely. anyway, yeah. I mean. You could fall asleep and the dog could get attacked or uh, any number yeah. of things like that i guess so so that is uh yeah good point that i hadn't thought of mm. you know i hadn't put my phone on silent better mute that oh neither have i yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm gonna smack for that <laughs> so yeah so i that, well let's let's talk about lures because that was that was something I wanted to to discuss with you so we've talked about female urine now i in my kit that I just purchased. So I, I'll give you a breakdown of, on my kit that I just purchased and you can, you know, it's very simple. You did, you did a really good video actually. I think it was your last upload was, was what's in your kit. And I thought that was fantastic. It was very okay. timely actually. Okay. So I, I got a kit. I just bought everything from Western Trapping Supplies because I just had to pay for shipping for one lot. And I bought um, three WTS traps and I bought the biggest ones they had because I got told bigger is better, but obviously you would use smaller ones where they they can fit and you know i'm happy to hear your opinion on that yeah um and uh i didn't buy the sponges because from what i understood that they're not the best they they affect the pressure that goes down on the pan um so i was just i told was told to use baking paper or wax paper um i bought a, a couple of steaks I, I think i bought these massive um 800 mil steaks which are way too long try to put them in the ground and and that uh, <laughs> it took me, I, I, two of them, I actually had to leave hang, half hanging out the ground, which I know is a problem because obviously the dog gets tangled up on it and then the swivel can go and you probably bend stuff and all that sort of stuff. But it is in an area really close to where my dad lives and he's monitoring it, you know, yeah. twice a day. So it shouldn't be an ethical issue with that. Um, and there's a lot of fencing materials there. So I don't think the, the smell of that is really going to be a problem. Um, and, and I bought the, 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 uh, double stake uh, chain ring, whatever you call it, to go on the end. We welded that on there. Um, I've got a couple of D shackles. I just got them from from Bunnings or whatever. Uh, yep. I did get the commercial dog gear on. Yep. So uh, they told me that they said it's 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 really good because the dog that it's harvested from just eats room meat, so it should taste as close to wild dog urine okay. as possible. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. Um, you know, whether any dog's urine is, is as good as the others. You know, it's, I don't know. I'm inexperienced. Um, and then I just went, I bought a pair of fencing pliers. Um, I bought a pair of gloves for my lures. I bought a pair of gloves for my trap handling. Um, I just got an old, um, uh, what do you, like a painter's sheet to go on the ground when I'm working on the traps. I bought a sieve. Um, now, I'm not happy with the sieve. The sieve is just, um, uh, just one of those rectangle ones with the full mesh. And, you know, you put the dirt in there and it just falls straight out onto my, my mat. So I need something. But, man, because I, I did actually look at the uh, – I can't remember the brand. I think it's like – I want to say it's like CJS one or something like that. And it's got the slide that comes yeah, out the bottom. Yeah. But, man, that thing is, like, quite expensive. So probably what I'm going to do is just get my angle grinder out, cut the slot in one end, and just put a piece of aluminium or a piece of tin in there that I can just pull out and, and use it. Um and I think that's about it. Pretty much everything you had in your kit was something I had. Um, I probably need a bigger hammer. That's probably something I, I realised. I've just got this short-handled mallet at the moment. And yeah. um, it's just not heavy enough. I probably need like double the weight to really smash those stakes in. And I don't have anything to get the stakes out, which I know is going to be a problem when I turn up to um, to remove yes. the traps. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I've seen that you can get like that UB crowbar with like a prong on the end that's specifically designed for pulling out the stakes. But I mean, my other mate that he does a bit of trapping, he actually just uses a star picket that's got a um, a big square thing welded on the end that's like 10 mil thick. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure actually how he removes them. I didn't see how he removed them, but he just mounts a D shackle to the star picket hole, um, and obviously quite cheap to manufacture yourself and and use. So yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm a bit um. I'm open to suggestions, obviously, with all that sort of stuff like that. But I thought I had enough for the basics. Probably don't have anywhere near enough traps, and but I don't have enough experience either. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, you just got to start off. 
you know, one trap's enough when you're starting off. Um, the whole, once again, I keep talking about the old fellas, but, you know, when you... Well, they're the ones you, that are teaching us, aren't they? Exactly, exactly. And, and you know, I, I just love sitting around listening to their stories, you know, but they always say you need two things to catch a dog. You need the dog and you need the trap. So, you know, if you've got that, you're halfway there. But, um, yeah, basically, um, like, having your, your pegs out of the ground. So when you're setting your trap, do you set the chain off to the side? So I'd been taught to set the chain immediately underneath the trap. Yeah. That's yeah. what I got told to do. But in this scenario, there was a massive, like, I'm, I'm in some quite ridgy country, yeah. like quite hilly. And it's, it's, there's so many rocks and I, I literally could not get this stake in more than two inches into the ground. Yeah. So I just went to the side, maybe 10 inches and I was able to drive the stake in yeah. Um, yeah. quite a way. Ultimately, I probably need to shorten the stakes as well, but I'm a bit scared of them pulling out, but that's just, yeah. uh, I guess, lack it's, of experience as well. It, so. it, it is handy having the long stakes for when you get that, you know, that softer ground. Um, I've actually physically had dogs pull, you know, um, sort of 12, 14 inch stakes straight out of the ground. And they've been two stakes put in the ground, crossed over like you meant to do it. And yeah. just in soft, you know, black soil country when it's been wet and dogs, you know, the chain obviously wasn't quite long enough. And the dog was jumping straight up in the air. And he, we actually got it on video and he jumped and pulled the whole trap, the whole pegs and everything straight out of the ground. Oh, like, so the trap went <laughs> off and he just jumped out. No, no, he had he had the trap on him, but when we were approaching him to shoot him, oh, he was okay, just, yep. you know, carrying on like they do, and yeah, jumped and pulled the trap and pegs and everything straight out of the ground, and that was with big long stakes. So, hang on to those stakes, but just get yourself a couple of sort of twelve inch ones. Or so. And what I normally do in that situation is put one long one in and one short one. Oh, okay. yeah, that's a good idea. Well, I, I just was like, you know, the price difference between the long ones and the short ones was next to nothing. I was like, if yeah. I need short ones, I'll just cut them down. Yeah. But um, <laughs> coincidentally, I just had some guy come in and do some retaining wall for me and he's left me like all these bits of Rio bar, oh, which is exactly the same. So now I just got to go get some nuts and we'll just weld them on at my dad's. And, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You get the, the best ones are the um, flange nuts. So those, they're like a normal nut with a, Obviously, a flange around the bottom, of like nearly like a um, uh, like a nut off the top of a diner bowl. You know those nuts? They've got a oh flat, yes, yes. And you put like that on a, upside down? No, no. They sit up the right way. But what that does, it sort of gives your chestnut steak ring a bit of a flat surface to sit on. So when you drive your in your um, steaks in, it's just a nice flat surface, and it's a bit wider. So if your chestnuts double steak ring. Um, Sometimes they can sort of warp a little bit and they can pull over just like a normal nut. Well, that's what I'd wondered if those those double shackle, uh, the, the double stake rings, if they um, were prone to opening up, like, I mean, they look pretty strong, but they can anything's possible, yeah. Yeah, especially when you're putting your, say if you've got your chestnut double stake ring like that and you're putting your your, your um, stakes in on, a, on an angle, put them like that. So they're going in opposite directions into the ground. So I I put mine like that so that yeah. they didn't cross over. Is that the right thing to do as opposed to go like that? Yeah, there's always different opinions, you know what I mean? It's just however it sort of works. But I always put them, say if it's like that, I'll put them in like that. Um, oh, okay. So you literally, so you got them here, you put one in like that and then one that way. Yeah. So yeah, okay. All yeah. right. Um, and also... You wear your chain hooks onto your double stake ring, have that on one end. A lot of the time people actually put that the, where the, the chain hooks onto the double stake ring in the middle of the two pegs. Ooh, that's where it's going to open up. Yes, yeah. exactly. And it can, it can open up. Um, I, I just instinctively put it on the end. That was yeah. not even a, uh, a thought to me. Yeah. That was, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, that's yeah. pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, let's let's get back to the lures where I got really distracted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Sorry, so I bought the commercial lure um, because I don't have access to a dog of my own. Yeah. I've got a mate that he reckons he's going to run around, follow his dog and collect some urine for me. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> I can't see that being too entertaining. I've heard, <laughs> I've heard you can uh, strap a bottle to like a pole, just put a bit of urine in there and then your dog will just keep topping it up 
over and over. And then once it's got a bit in there, it can't help itself. It just, well, you put yeah. a funnel there. Yeah. Um, I've seen all sorts of setups like that and, you know, actual posts with a, with a, a, a like a bowl around the bottom of them. So the dog goes and urinates. Um, a lot of the commercial lures are, are pretty good. Um, you know, you buy them from anywhere and they're, they're all pretty good. Like they've obviously worked. Otherwise people, they wouldn't have them over here. You know, I've found that the, the fresher, the better. So I seem to only be able to sort of, well, I only keep mine for about six months. Obviously when you are using them, you're only using a pinprick, a pinprick of it. You know, you're not using too much of it. Yeah. I, um, and that's probably something you might just touch on for, for the listeners is like, you just, you just want to like a little drip. You don't want to go no, squirt no. like a whole lot, do you? No, you just literally need like a match, match stick, like a, just get a stick and just dip it in and then put your lure wherever you put place in your lure. Wow. That's even less than I, I just, I got the thing and I just did a, like a quick little squirt, which like put probably ran down the tree, maybe like yep. six inches. It depends so probably... what lure you're using in as well. So there's a lot of different lures and a lot of them are, are quite offensive. Like they've got a lot of skunk incidents in them a lot of the time. Oh, so these are some of the <clears throat> non-dog urine. Well, let's talk about what are yeah. the different sorts of, of scents. Because I know yeah. I've seen on YouTube some people make up some concoctions of... And apparently they just can go off like a bomb too if they get it wrong. Like, yeah, I don't know, yeah, yeah. talking about mincing up kidneys or livers or something i was like yeah. oh man <laughs> <laughs> yeah no there's there's you know hundreds of thousands of them probably that people have sort of tried over the years and and to be honest a lot of them work you know because a dog naturally is quite curious so they'll if they smell something they'll naturally go and try and investigate what it is you know the way i look at it is um so there's there's um Lures that are gland based. So what they are is they're actually physically cut out of the dogs. The glands that are cut out of the dogs. So okay, there's yep. lots of lots of glands in every animal, as you probably know. We're well, just so, like people. I think we've got them in our armpits, in our necks, in our groin, yeah. all yeah. that sort of stuff like that. Yeah. So same type of thing. Yeah. So there's there, there's gland based lures. So what people do is cut the glands out of the dogs that they catch, keep them glands and then add little things to them um i personally love that type of lure like that's probably my go-to lure um, yeah okay percent of the time because it's natural and because it comes from you know it's fresh um and it also is basically the wild dogs that are we trying to catch it's out of them so it's not something that's too foreign yeah so it's from the territory yeah essentially yeah yeah um so it's sort of there's gland based lures, there's food based lures, and there's curiosity based lures, um, which can be just as simple as like shrimp essence or um, vanilla essence or, you know, a bit of aniseed, stuff like that. And is that, it would, so the skunk one, that would be a, a curiosity yeah, lure? It's more of a curiosity lure, but it's very, very strong. Like <laughs> you can, you can, they're, they're more of a long, what they call long distance call with, a, with a, anything that's got skunk in it. So that'll, um, you know, that's quite offensive. And that, that is one if if you ever play on a practical joke on someone and you put a little touch of it on them, it just smells for miles, you know. I think, days. is there a video of yours with that in there? Yeah, yeah, Trent gets a bit on him, on his <laughs> shirt in the car, yeah. <laughs> so, so when they talk about wearing gloves to handle your lures, mm-hmm. they're talking about the just so you don't get it on yourself or is it so you don't get the human scent on the lure as well? Or is it more just to protect yourself because of the, how toxic it is? I think as far as the lure goes, yeah, it's more just to protect yourself because if you get it on your skin, it literally takes a, you know, hours to scrub off or, you know, different stuff. Like we've tried tomato sauce. We've tried, you know, disinfectant to try and get lure off. Yeah. If you ever break a bottle, just throw your gear out, you know, and just start again because you'll never get the smell out of it. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I, I bet if you went to sleep, if you had like Treno, probably if he slept in his swag that night, would he wake up with a wild dog rolling on him? Is it? <laughs> yeah, could do. Probably, probably, yeah. yeah. Although the noise that comes out of him when he's asleep is quite full on. So I don't think a dog would even go near him when he's asleep. <laughs> yeah, my, my dad sounds like a... Um, <laughs> 
two stroke chainsaw, eh? Big one. It's um, it's quite loud. <laughs> so, well, that's what I. So, yeah, I, I'm not. If I, I when I was a bit bigger, uh, I've lost a couple of kilos now. But when I was bigger, man, I yeah, I had some real problems. I could only sleep on one side, or yeah. otherwise I'd snore too aggressively. Not to say that I wouldn't if I slept on that side. So what I was going to do in my my uh, so I I got a tin box that I put all my stuff in, and I'd been recommended by a guy called Tony who who's I think does a lot of training out um, Gimpy way and all that sort of stuff like that. I, I met him at the gun range actually by chance. So that was really yeah. good to meet him. And he said to get a tin box or get a box to put all your stuff in. He recommend keeping leaves and sticks from the area that you hunt. And he's cause he didn't wait. He goes, don't worry about the um, trapping dye. Oh, that's what I bought trapping dye and the wax as well. Yeah. And um, he said, don't worry about that. Just use the tenon from the leaves from the area and just keep that in your box. And that stops the, any too much scent. And yeah. his hot tip then was you lock that with a padlock so that no one can come around and go, Oh, check the it. traps out. And then they're touching traps and then you've got to go and boil them up and yeah. re-wax them and all that sort of stuff like that. So I thought that was actually a, a pretty good top tip actually. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's... So what, oh, what, so what I was going to say was, so in there, what I want to do is get some like PVC and then pop rivet it to one corner so that the, um, the lure doesn't fall over and run the risk of tipping through my, my box. Yeah. I'd, I'd get a separate box for your lure. Okay. All your lures to go in because it, even though it's in a sealed container, the, the smell just still leaches out. And literally, once you boil your traps um, and, you know, handle them with gloves and everything, do everything after that you do, you don't want any other smells to be near your traps whatsoever. Okay. Or it might be time to so, definitely yeah, pull them out, yeah. Just, I, I just use, like, a fish and tackle box for all my lures. Um, yeah, so I've okay. just got a couple of fish and tackle boxes with different lures in it um, that I use, yeah. So, but, yeah, keep them separate to your traps and all your gear, totally. All right, so I really should have a, a box for the traps, a box for the tools. Oh, actually, I didn't mind your bag you got there for your tools. That was pretty good too. Yeah. And yeah. then a box for your lures. Yeah, yeah. But obviously, you're moving a huge <clears throat> number of traps too compared to me, so. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah, it's always good to have them have things separate because the idea is you, you want the, the dog to come to the lure and if you've got any of that any of that smell whatsoever on that is in your traps, that dog will smell that there's something there. And, you know, half the time you'll get your traps dug up because yeah, the dog okay. can smell it. And they're quite crafty. You know, they haven't thrived in Australia the way they do with being dumb. So. No, well, what's interesting, I just, because I'm going to go, I, I actually got access to a place that's um, about an hour and 11 minutes from my door and I'm in Brisbane. So that was, um, yeah. did a bit of door knocking and uh, I did a bit, what I did was I, a change of tactics. So, um, you know, I've tried to get access to places closer. And, you know, it's, it's funny, I, people just don't really bother to, to go out, I think is, is really my opinion, because I went out door knocking and within an hour and a half of door knocking, I had access to a property to about 3,000 acres. Yeah. And it was so easy. I, I don't know, look, I'm, I'm 39 now, so I don't look like a young punk. And maybe that gave me a, a level of trust that wouldn't have been there if I tried to do it 20 years ago. But I just decided rather than try and be a bit of a, you know, Going, going to chase pigs, which I think is can be considered quite Yahoo. I just was like, you know what? I'm just going to go out and tell people that I want to get wild dogs because I like the the thrill of the chase of, yeah. of uh, getting the wild dogs. I haven't got one yet. I haven't trapped one or I haven't shot one yet. I've only seen one once. And, um, but so that was, and yeah, and literally within an hour and a half of door knocking, I got access to this block. And so I'm going out there this weekend, which is only a little bit away from my dad's place. Um, where I've got the other traps set and there's wild dogs all through there. Um, there's plenty of sign. Um, anyway, he told me on the phone cause I phoned him up like 20 minutes before we had this meeting. And uh, he said he saw five wild dogs during the yeah, week. Wow. He okay. said his dog started barking and ran around the other side of the house. So he went around the other side of the house. Yeah. He said, and there's these two wild dogs having a scrap, like, you know, 50, 60 meters from the house. Yeah. And his, his two like um, Kelpies are like barking their heads off at it. Yeah. As he's standing there watching them, then he looked up and about another 150 meters away, down on the damn wall, there was three other wild dogs looking on. Yeah, like, was, yeah. I was like, yeah. oh man. He's like, yeah, yeah, you got to get out of here. I was like, oh man. So like, I'm keen to get back out there. Yeah. And but it's like I just like 
I need to make sure I hit the right places to try and howl them in or get there at the right times and all that sort of stuff like that. So yeah, hopefully we can cover off on a little bit of that. At some, yeah, some yeah, yeah. Tonight. So that's, so that's, you know, I'm pretty excited about it because I've got access like right at the right time. I probably got access to this place maybe two months ago. So I've been out there three times now. Yep. Saw deer the first day, saw three deer, which was pretty cool. But I've seen prints and I've seen like pretty fresh scat for the wild dogs. So yep. they're definitely there. Um, I found one of the dens that they have been using. And he yeah, told okay. me that this old bloke used to go down there every year, go down there, pull pups out of this den. So I'm pretty keen, but I don't want to, I don't want to terrorize that spot so that yeah. they don't use it as well. So that's why I, I think I've got to wait till about June, maybe mid June before I go and have a look in there to see if I can yeah, catch yeah, the dog yeah. in there with pups. So yeah, but I don't want to leave it too late that they leave the den either. So yeah, that's right. It's, it's a hard thing. Yeah, and if, if you've actually, you know, a lot of the time, if you actually approach that den before the bitch gets there to put in it, like, better pups in there, and she won't use it. Like, she'll be able to smell the human scent around there and she won't use it at all. But sometimes they do, you know. Sometimes, as I said before, if they haven't had a, a negative interaction with a human, they'll still use it. So, yeah. And how, how long will she sit in the den with the pups? Like, what do you, well, what's, they actually, what are you, they, your thoughts? They actually move them around quite a bit. So a bitch will have a litter of pups in one area and she could move them four or five times by the time that they're sort of old enough to be quite mobile themselves. So yeah, she'll wow. move them around to different little locations around. It could be just like under a tussock of grass um, for a little bit and then move them on to another spot and then, yeah. And how often are you stumbling across the pups? Like, is that a fairly rare occasion or with good work, um, you, you're stumbling across them quite frequently? Yeah, like that, like that old fellow you were just talking about, you usually find out the areas where the pups, um, you know, the bitches are having pups every year. Um, a lot of the time, if a bitch um, has pups in one area, a lot of the time she'll come back to that same spot most years. Yeah, and you'll okay. find it. You'll find that other bitches, if they've, if that bitch has been taken out of that area, another bitch will move in. She'll nearly use the same spots as well. It's yeah, just so like just... a natural instinct to them. That, so once you find out those areas, it's yeah, you can sort of go back there most years and find pups in those areas. Yeah, excellent. Because my brother's also got a property up at um, seventeen seventy, and yep. um, we went to walk through there, and I found dog sign all through there, and I found what looked to be some good dog dens. These are like caves. I'm talking about like caves in river, river banks and stuff like that. Yeah. And, um, but obviously hadn't been used because this was like, this was like three months ago or maybe even four months ago. Um, so I was like, Oh man, can't wait to come here when, yeah. when the season's on, you know, they might, cause the dogs are there. They're definitely there. It's just a matter of um, crying them out at the right time. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. But yeah, no, there's a lot, there's a lot to learn about it, you know, and, one thing I try and tell everyone is try and learn as much as you can before you physically go out and try and tr like tr shooting's different, but as far as trapping goes, it's a good idea to try and um, learn as much as you can before you go out and sort of physically trap areas because sometimes what you can do is, is mitch, like catch a dog and it gets away or toe catch him or something like that. And it can sort of ruin that area for a little while. They'll always come back to there, but it can sort of get the dogs to move out of that area. And then you sort of, you know, you miss your opportunity. Well, well, let's talk about that. Well, first of all, I've heard that, um, that with the new laminated, well, sorry, with the offset traps, which is now just for those that don't know, that means it's got a gap in the, um, where the steel joins. There's a, it's about a five mil gap. Yeah. So that, that gap, that's what they call the offset, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Now in, yeah. in Queensland, we don't aren't required to have a, a rubber um, pad on there, but it, I, I know in New South Wales you have to have a rubber, rubber pad, but it still has to be an offset. But from what I've heard, though, since they've introduced the offset, is actually trapping success rate has gone through the roof because um, they reckon maybe because the bones aren't breaking and the skin's not being perforated at... Um, you can get toe toe grabs, whereas you couldn't in the past with like the teeth and all that sort of stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so that that was I thought was quite interesting. Yeah. So the old the old style traps that you see, um, you know, the old style dogger traps with the 
they've got serrated jaws on them. Yeah, the bear claw ones. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what they used to do was they'd actually, you know, physically snap the leg and break the break the uh, skin, and then the dogs would be twisting around and then obviously just pull their leg off. Yeah, like like that <coughs> dude that got his arm stuck in the crevice and he chopped it off with a. Yeah, 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 like yeah, a, yeah. So <laughs> they um, do the same thing, don't they? The will yeah. to live is pretty strong, so. Absolutely, and you hear about those stories about, you know, foxes chewing their own legs off and stuff. They probably yeah. nine times out of ten didn't actually chew their leg off. They probably just literally broke it off because that was the style of trap that used to be used. Yeah, and um, if you do get those old traps, you can modify them into um, offset traps as well, can't you? They're not yeah, gone to waste. Exactly. Exactly. It, and as you said, in Queensland, every state's a little bit different as far as the, um, you know, the conditions of what type of traps and that stuff you can use. But these ones, these days, like this one um, with the offset, the idea is you still get blood flow. So when the, the dog or the fox or the animal's legs caught in that, that actually, that gap is designed to allow enough blood flow to that area where it's not going to sort of cut off, you know, obviously blood flow and then cause the animal further pain and stress or have the leg fall off. And yeah, yeah and also they don't, they're designed not to break the skin and stuff like that. Um, all the bone, yeah. So, yeah, okay. So you were you were talking about um, being patient and all that sort of stuff like that. So, because that's one thing I did see in that video was you were talking about essentially scouting, using trail cams, um, tracking, looking for scrape marks. Um, what's like, like how long are you doing all that planning before you actively put traps in the ground? Is one so, day enough or not really. Well, it depends. Like, it depends on, first of all, how long you've got, you know, um, and how much time you want to put into it. Say, for instance, when we're going to a property, say we get a call from a, a landowner that's got 6,000 acres and they're having trouble with dogs killing their cows, we'll go out there and we'll actually, the first thing what we do is drive around the whole property with the farmer and find out where they've seen the dogs, where they've had attacks, things like that. Um, and then we'll put cameras in. Um, and we'll leave our cameras in for like up to three weeks before we actually go back again, suss out the situation again. But sometimes a farmer wants results straight away, which is understandable, you know, that sometimes they've lost 10 or 15 calves, you know, in these properties. So we'll stay out there and just straight away look for sign that day find out print you know where this where the dogs are traveling and put in traps straight away and a lot of the time if you are sort of um there when the dogs are there you'll you'll get results straight away so the first night sort of thing yeah okay um, <clears throat> but because they sort of they do move around a bit don't they like even though they might be hitting that property they might only be going there once a week or twice a week or something like that is that yeah. correct that's right, yeah. It all depends on the size of the pack. Um, it depends on, on, so they have a lot, what we call a home range. So yep. the home range will, will vary, you know, from anywhere from two sort of square kilometers to 20 square kilometers. Um, depends on the size of the pack, the food availability, how many other packs are in the area. There's quite a, quite a few variables with that. Um, yeah, but wow. what you do, so, like any animals, you sort of look for those hot spots where animals will naturally congregate or, or go to. Um, dogs in particular, we use things like ridge lines and roadways as, as intersections. Yes, so I've heard actually, that, yep. And they'll use them like a boundary. So they'll, <clears throat> they'll go and, and mark that intersection or that boundary marker. However big their, their home range is, they'll go back there once a week, once a day, once a month, once every two weeks, whatever, the, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, so, well, you talk about the boundary thing. That's that's one of the things that I, I found really interesting is, you know, like uh, that they, they'll they get their scat and they'll balance it on top of like a tuft of grass. And, and I was telling yeah. my brother about this. It's like, yeah, they'll put it somewhere really prominent. And then yeah. we're at his place. And in the in the riverbed, there was these rocks. Now, do you know what a can is? That's like when, you know, the tourists make the little stacks of rocks. Oh, okay. Is that a, called a can, is it? Uh, or a can. Yeah, I okay. think it's called a can. Anyway, there was like these couple <coughs> of, where there's just like two stacks of rocks. 
and you could see where dogs had put a turd on top and it had rolled off onto the side as it got old and crusted. I said, so I said to him, that's what I was talking about. They put it somewhere real prominent. And, like, yeah. and sure enough, as we walked like another 50, 100 metres, and there was more like where they would put them on top of big boulders and all this sort of stuff like that. Like, yep. That's amazing. Like, so oh. what do they call it? A, a, a visual? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, a bit of a visual thing. You'll find a lot of the time too is they'll actually put it on the on the side of the um, predominant wind direction. So if they're, <laughs> they're quite amazing, hey, like say if it's an intersection, a T intersection, yep. and you've got the wind coming that way across the T intersection, the dogs will use this corner to mark. Yeah, so they, they want to get the best value from their, <coughs> their one yep. piece of scat. Because I, I guess that's something that people that don't understand dogs might not appreciate is they're not just taking a dump anywhere, are they? No. That's valuable material, and they're Absolutely. using it to mark their territory. Yeah. In prominent Absolutely. locations, they they're like they're saving it. Man, they must yeah. do huge farts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, they um they're quite yeah. That's why I love doing it so much. It's you know, <clears throat> growing up, you always sort of like hunting and things like that, but. For some reason, dogs. I just love the the challenge of every dog's different, you know. And you can never just go in and be blasé about it and catch a dog where well, you can. But you know, I want to be able to catch the smart ones. You know what I mean? So it's it's quite a challenge. And when you so get that's... one, when you get a dog that you know has been a challenge for like two years, you've been trying to chase this one dog for two or three years and you're finally getting it's just the best feeling and so do you so can you tell that it's a particular animal that's evading you even if you're picking up other dogs at the same time is that like yeah you can sort of um well we we use a lot of trail cameras i suppose which is a bit of a cheap way to do it but okay so you've got like literally images and you go, okay, that one's got a brown nose or a white tail yeah. or something like that. And you're seeing the same animal over and over. Yeah. But they still sort of have the similar characteristics as well. Like one dog will, you know, for instance, he'll walk along a track and, and veer off it and, and then walk along the side of the track for a little while and then get back onto a track and, or things like that. Or they'll, they'll approach your traps a certain way. So you'll see their prints approaching a trap and then they'll, skip to the right or to the left and you know and then they sort of keep those characteristics so you sort of know if you haven't got cameras out there you'll be able to read their sign basically and say well yeah. that, that's that same dog and so what are the different signs so you've got obviously got the just prints yeah um, i mentioned scrape marks now that's yep. i guess for for the people listening or watching that's the classic when you see a dog like urinate and then they do the the back leg scraping on the ground like the real territorial thing. Now, I believe that that's a visual um, sign for other dogs as well. That's yeah. not just in certain their dominance sort of thing. Now, you know, you'll see a big old um, dominant male dog do that, but you also see big dominant female dogs do that. Yeah, um, and is well. that something that you would do when you set a trap? Is do some fake scrape marks? Yeah, sometimes I do. It depends what sort of dog you're chasing. Um, so when you go into an area, say if there's two dogs in an area um, and you know from your trail camera videos and what the farmers told you, the way that the dogs are acting, you'll know if they're younger dogs or older dogs a lot of the time. Um, if you're after younger dogs, it's not something that I'll do because it will scare the younger dogs off. Um, I oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. You know, um, because it's obviously a younger dog comes along, sees that and he's like, oh, hang on a minute. There's a big old dominant dog in any area. I'm out of here. Yeah. So, you know. That's something I ha actually hadn't thought about at all. I mean, uh, you know, that's that's probably a whole other conversation on its own, nearly. I oh, guess, man, that, there's, that there's a lot to learn. There's a lot to learn. Like, you know, oh, I'm still learning. I've only, you know, I'm only just cracking the surface of what you sort of have to think about. Yeah. All right. Well, let's. you've got that trap there. Let's, yep. let's talk about some of the, the construction and... Um, like what you maybe look for in a trap or um, yep. all that sort of stuff like that. I only know a couple of the terms like the pan, I know yep. the night latch and um, yep. that's about it. <laughs> so these um, these particular traps are uh, what we call a dogless trap. So 
basically they've got the pan, as you were talking about, which is this part. That that's the bit that people step on, that or that the dog steps on. Yeah, yeah. Yep. yeah. You hope that people don't step on it. So, yeah, obviously that has to go down for the jaws to close. Now, I believe the dog is the old school trap, like on a mouse trap. That's the bit that goes over the bit that the, that the holds actual, the jaw down. Uh, holds yeah. the jaw down. So, yeah. a dogless one doesn't have that pin they're going over. It's. No. That's well, right. So, night latch, so yeah, so it's a bit hard to see on here, but basically there's a there's a section under under the jaws of these ones that this little part here clips onto when you've got the jaw folded down, and that actually okay. So there's a, a little there's a tab sticking out from that jaw at the bottom at the top there. I can see the tab. Yeah, and that on the pan that clicks onto the um onto that, that clips, tab. Yeah, yeah, that clips onto that section, and so um, that on the pan there on that. On that bit, that that's got the night latch on it. Can yes. you want to tell us what the night latch does? So the night latch is just like a, a little groove that's cut out along here, um, and basically all that's for is to lessen the trigger um, movement before the trap was set off. Now that's I believe you're supposed to have it on full latch while you're like digging it in and all that sort of stuff, and then you try and set it to the night latch before you bury it under. But um, a, when you're first I, starting, when I you're couldn't first do starting, it. Yeah, every time it, I tried to set the night trap, I just, just jump up out the ground and shoot dirt in my face. And yeah, yeah. The um, so um, once again, there's a you know, <laughs> we could we could sit here forever talking about how to set your traps up, but there's a thing called what we call. So this one is very loose. What's what we call pan tension. Yep. So, um. I always have my traps set, depending on, once again, depending on the time of year, but majority of the time of year, I'll have my traps set so it takes five pound of downward pressure before my trap will go off. Now, now how do you measure that? Do you get a five pound sinker and drop it on there or? Yeah, so you can get like a four and a half pound hammer or something like that um, and sit on your pan. And then if it doesn't go off, you know your, your traps are about right. And then if you okay. get a tiniest bit of, pressure down it'll go off that means it's around about the right one right weight but you can get a thing called a sullivan pan tester which i had in my bag yep yeah i saw that the other day so uh, i've got i've got another video as well um i think it's called predator trap maintenance or something like that which sort of explains and shows you how to use those sorts of things as well okay right. um, <clears throat> but yeah basically it's a it's like a, a stick with a spring inside of it and it's got it's got um, like lines per pound. So you oh, okay. So it's it kind of like a torque wrench or something like as you go down yeah. and you can see how far down it goes before it goes off and that lets That's you right. know, yeah. know yeah. what it is. So what yeah. else is on the trap there? What's, um, cause there's um, like Jake traps. I know is a favorite brand and yeah. You know. So this, these traps here, these have just been sitting out in the shed. I've got to boil them up again, but these ones are actually brand new. These are called canine extreme traps. Um, so they are these, US one? Yeah, they are. I got these. So, so I just I guess just for those listening, that a lot of them come from the US because the coyote trapping is huge. So a lot of the stuff we use is based on coyote trapping equipment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so these are basically very similar to what they call a WTS uh, or a dogless bridger number three. Yep. The only difference with them, and, and um, I just got a few of these to trial because they're a reason, well, I've never seen them before i believe they have been around for a while you can get them pretty regularly now but they're basically a heavy duty model of the wts number three or the bridger number three dogless now which, number three determines the size isn't it that's like yeah yeah so that's that's the number three whereas this one here that's a number five yeah so i think i got number five yeah um so this is a WTS number five. So this is a, a once again, a dogless trap. So and that's got, got the, the rubber jaws on it, doesn't it, that one? Yeah, it does, yeah. Yeah. Um, and do you like the rubber jaws? I, not as much as I used to. I, I really liked them when I first started using them. But now I just find that there's way too much maintenance. Um, that's what so I got told, yep. Every time you catch a dog, they, they chew the, the crap out of all the rubbers and you've got to replace the rubbers basically yeah so it's an extra little bit that you have to do um and so, obviously if you want to reset them you don't want to have to handle it too much yeah and all that's that right 
That's right. So if you re when you catch a dog on these, the dog chews all the rubber off or half the rubber out, you've got to reset it. Um, yeah, you lost you lost half your rubber, so yeah, do have that chance of you know the the rest of the rubber might fall away, which you might lose your dog, but it's very unlikely. Um, but it can happen. So that's a that's a um, yeah WTS number five, which is a bit bigger. These ones are a little bit bigger than a, than the WTS number three, but as I said, they're just more heavy duty, so all the steel and everything's a bit thicker in it. Um, but yeah, they're they're probably my my go-to trap now. There's a there's an old um, trap style called a Jake trap, which is um, you probably would have heard of. It's a very yeah. Yeah. Very good, solid, strong, fast trap. I don't believe they're getting made anymore. Is that no, true? The guy right. died, passed away or something like that? Yeah, yeah. So, so if these... you can get it, second-hand ones are worth a fortune, I believe. Yeah, yeah. I've got quite a few of them still, which I still use and I love them. But um, because they're not getting made anymore, I was sort of looking for something to go to. And I think these are, these are going to be the one that I'll, that I'll go to. Um, and, and you said it's a heavier build. Are they prone to bending and breaking? Um, under use or not really? So the, the Douglas number threes that I've had, um, I, I actually sold all of mine probably 12 months ago or eight months ago now, um, only because I got these. And the Douglas number threes were great traps, but I just found that after a little while, the sort of the pans in them start to get a little bit weak and there's a little section here what's cut out. See that section's cut out. Oh yeah, it looks so, like we'd be prone to cracking across there, maybe. Yeah, it, none of mine were, but I could just see that that's, that part would be a would be a sort of a, a weak part in the trap. Um, so these pans are quite a lot thicker than the than the W than the Bridger threes or. The and that is a re, that is a re, uh, replaceable part. The the yeah, pan you can get. Uh, it is. It is new parts for them. Yeah, but also the like the base plate. This section here, what we call the base plate is yep. a lot thicker. Um, the bolts, they're actually bolted on, whereas the other traps are just folded through or bent. bent oh, yeah, and them. there's like a little T-bit on there or something like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So these are just a... They they look to me like they'll be a really good trap for a lot longer, basically. They just look a bit heavier duty. Um, and then on the bottom of them, yeah, we've got like a... What's called a, a swivel, a, cr a crunch-proof swivel. So yeah, basically, okay. that doesn't look. Is that welded? The um, the no, bit attached yet. to the swivel. Not oh, got because it's still so these, okay, yeah. yeah, these are just been sitting in the shed. I did boil them once, but I, what I tend to do is um, so when I get a new trap, we're going sort of off track a little bit. But when we get in, when I get a new trap, I'll um, wash them with like soapy water, degreaser, or so, yeah, like yeah, get the oil off them. Yeah. They covered in packing grease and all that sort of stuff to yeah. make them not rust. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So then we, uh, so then I'll boil them up and then I'll leave them in the shed for a few weeks or a couple of weeks usually. Yep. Um, and then I'll then I'll boil them and wax them and then leave them sit for a little bit longer. And just till they get a film of like these are ready to go again. They've just got a, a good film of rust over them now. Yeah, light surface rust is what. Yeah. Is that's what you guys are looking for to give it a bit of a porous surface for the wax to stick to and all that sort of stuff. Like yeah. That or yeah, and, and, and so also when, I use you, trap dye as well. Sorry, mate. Oh, you do use trap dye? Just the yeah. logwood or you've got your own? Um, logwood or whatever is available. So as um, you were talking about any sort of leaves, like a bloodwood tree, um, the sap out of a bloodwood tree or the leaves out of a bloodwood tree work really well as well. Yep. Um, so they you just put them in the water when you're boiling your traps up and that, that'll sort of naturally stain your trap. Um it, the and reason, what's your, oh yeah, yeah, no, you're right. The reason behind actually staining the traps, I don't really know because they're in the ground anyway, you know, and there's always different opinions on why people do certain things. I just do it because that's the way I've been taught. If you get a really strong wind, sometimes, you know, a little bit of the the um, soil can be blown off the, off the jaw of your trap or something like that. So it does help to camouflage it a little bit, but a dog's going to notice it anyway. So, you know, <clears throat> as far as the dyeing your traps go, I don't know how, you know, um, successful that is, but I do it, you know, as I say in a lot of my videos, I want to give myself 
the best possible chance to catch every dog, not just any dog, you know? Well, what's interesting is when I did dye mine, they definitely came out much blacker. I yeah. mean, they went in, they were like a, a blue silver color and they come out quite black in comparison. I was, I was actually quite impressed with, yeah. with that. Yeah. And so when you when you wax them, are you are you just doing the trick of floating the wax on top of your boiling water, or yes. have you got a whole tub of wax on its own? No, I don't use a whole tub. I just use the wax on top of the water and just pull the traps up through the wax, nice and slowly. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I find that gets a good enough cover of wax on them. And basically, once again, the wax to me is just to a lot of the time just to prolong the the traps and keep them firing fast. And also preserve the, the steel. Um, yep. um, there's lots of once again, there's lots of different opinions on why it's done and why it's not done and things like that. You know, but I just find that it, your traps will last a lot longer being preserved a little bit. It makes you wonder if that's just something like old man Jake that makes Jake traps. He's like, Yeah, you gotta wax your traps and that's it, everyone wax their traps after that. Yeah, yeah, possibly, yeah. Because there's there's some fellas that just put it brand new trap in the ground and catch dogs as well you know so um yeah all these things are sort of personal preference yeah, but, yeah um, well, i guess it, it and it does and that's what i you know from all the conversations i have had with a few people is like you know if you're trapping dogs in a junkyard well you don't even have to bury the trap you know yeah. but if you're if you're trapping out in the bush where no one's been for six weeks then you've got to cover every trace that you've been there yeah you know, all but rake your tire tracks on the way out yeah yeah <laughs> so now I try and I try and camouflage my traps the best as I can, no matter where I'm trapping. Um, yeah, it's just what I do, you know. And as I said, it's it's just sort of what I've had success with. So, so when you when you do put your traps in the ground, you set in the night latch and just go in for gold after that, or you set the night latch when you're nearly finished. No, no, I'll set I'll set them the night latch when I put them in the ground. Like yeah, and then put them in the ground. Yeah, because that's what um, I find I end up having work to do. Around. Yeah. So I just, yeah. and of course Depend. I had like, like little sticks in there to, to try and tuck the, <laughs> the baking yeah. paper in and all that. Like you get, you get sort of, obviously the more you do it, you'll get better at it. You know, I'm more confident around it and stuff like that. You can get a little bit too confident. Touch wood, I haven't actually caught my hands in a trap yet, but I know lot, lots of people that have. So I could um, see, I could see how quickly that could happen. Like, you know, you oh, set yeah. like a couple of traps. Oh yeah, no, nah, you can touch that. No, <laughs> bang, yeah. next thing. Fingers yeah. caught in the trap, and yeah. then you've got to somehow try and, you know, you probably caught both hands, and then you've got to yeah. use your feet to try and open it up. Absolutely, it's quite <laughs> it's, funny watching people try and do that. <laughs> and, and, you know, I'll be honest. Like at the moment, I've been having to like put my hand up against the tree to try and put my feet on both sides of the trap to like it's quite a balance. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Quite. Now you get once again you get used to it. Like I can set them with my hands now. So. Oh wow! Um, most of them. These big number fives are quite hard to do, but you can get them. But, um, yeah, the, I like to make sure my pan tension is set right before I go and set the traps as well. Yeah, so right. every time I'll get a trap out to put it in the ground, I'll test the pan tension before I even look at set. And so that tension, is that set mostly with those side bolts, is it? So yeah, so, so on these, yeah, you just tighten or loosen those. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that, that one's yeah, the same. So that's just got a, a lock nut. On it, and on boiling it. them doesn't affect that lock nut. That was a question I had actually. Uh, yeah. So, so um, boiling traps, you know, year year after year or month after month, can affect a lot of things in them. It'll affect the springs in them. So you got to make sure you don't boil them for too long. Um, and I have gone to respringing my traps every twelve months now, putting new springs. Oh wow. Through. Um, wow. Only because I've had one dog actually pull out of a trap and I had him on video. He was caught proper, like up above the pad where you meant, where they're meant to be caught. Yep. So above the it. ankle bone, basically. Yeah, it's, yeah, it probably is. Yeah, it's just above the pad. Yep. So you'll see. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was caught well and good and it actually pulled straight out on video. Um, and that's when I, was, I prompted me to sort of check check them all out, and that was what it, I just felt because you set them with your with your hands, you can actually feel the strength of the trap. Um, and I was feeling that my new traps compared to my old traps were quite soft now. So now I've heard that filming 
the trapping location can reduce success rate significantly. Have you found that or not to be the case? Uh, I don't put the, I never put the camera right in the vision of the dog. I try and put it off to the side a little bit where, you know, the dog hopefully isn't going to see it too much because it can, yeah, absolutely. Especially... Were you talking about you've set up the camera like a couple of weeks before? Yeah. And then you just leave it there rather than contaminate the area, I guess, to some degree. Yeah. And yeah. then set the traps there. Yeah. And certain cameras, you know, I don't I don't care what people say, but certain cameras definitely make certain noises or give off certain frequencies and, and animals can actually hear them or see them. Um, they definitely smell them as well. So they'll smell that the human's been there and they can smell the plastic on the cameras and oh. things like that. Mate, you open so, the box and those things stink half the time, like that sort of yeah. stuff. Yeah. I mean, the plastic's um, quite fumy. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I definitely don't put them right in, in an area where I've got a, a dog that I've, a hard dog that I've been trying to catch for a while. Um, but definitely, I like to put cameras over traps just to see our dogs, how I'm going, basically. It, that, it teaches you so much, on, especially when you've got them on video. Um, oh, yeah. You, you quickly learn the things that you're doing right and the things that you're doing wrong, so. That's so, I've watched some videos and just sometimes just the sheer number of animals coming through in one evening is just incredible. Like you, yeah. you just that's what really surprising. Like um, a dog runner on YouTube, like he's put a you know camera on this stump or this this like a big log falling across a creek thing. Yeah, man, just in one night, I think I saw like eleven different dogs come across the log. Like just yeah. insane. Like you just wouldn't think that that it would hold up that sort of volume of animals. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Incredible. Yeah. They're worth their weight in gold cameras. Yeah. I've, I've got one Aldi one, but uh, yeah. I set it up on my brother's property to try and see if I could see some dogs yeah. and um, I haven't been able to go get it because of the coronavirus restrictions. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, I'll, I'll have to get some more. Apparently those, um, apparently the Kings ones aren't too bad. So. Okay. I'm keen to get a couple of them. I think they're only about 120, 130 bucks. They don't have SD cards or anything like that. You've got to go. Sorry, yeah. don't have uh, SIM cards. So you can't like use yeah, your mobile phone to get it. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, better than nothing, I guess. Yeah. Well, let's absolutely. talk about, let's talk about some of the um, trapping terms. That's, I think, um, okay. I think, I guess, and maybe the trap types, like I heard in your video, you talk about a, a whole trap. Um, a whole set. A whole like set. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and all that sort of stuff like that. So, I, you know, you often you hear people talk about a, a trapping line. Yep. Um, yeah, what, what does all that mean, I guess? Yeah, so it's, um, it's basically, it's just the different types of sets that you put in the ground. So, you know, um, there's, there's, you know, once again, there's probably, we probably don't have enough, enough battery on the computers to uh, go through it all, but there's different types of sets. So there's scent post sets, there's flat sets, there's hole sets, there's trail sets, blind sets, walkthrough sets. So there's all different types of um, uh, situations where you put your trap and different sort of locations where you put traps. And once again, that all depends on the activity and, and the, um, the way that the dogs are acting in that, in that area. And also what you've done leading up to that time as well. Like, as I said, we use a lot of cameras so we can sort of evaluate how many dogs are in an area, um, if they're old dogs, if they're young dogs, you know, so that'll determine, that'll sort of give you an idea of what type of set you're going to put in. Yeah. Okay. So, so a whole set is just like literally in some kind of hole, is that? Yeah. So basically the idea behind a whole set is to mimic a, um, a rabbit or some sort of rodent or a bandicoot or something digging a hole into the ground. And um, it's a bit of a visual lure as well. So a dog will naturally sort of check those holes to see if there's any animals in there that they can eat. Okay. So, and that would be <clears throat> similar to, to like a, a post set where you would set the trap like 40 centimeters back off the hole type thing as well. Is that? Yeah. Um, well, you'd... Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I sort of don't really use that one as much. I don't, I haven't probably seen it as much. Um, but oh, I only heard I'll... it on, I only heard it on that video when you're speaking to that coyote guy. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. So the, the whole, the whole set, um, 
once again, it's different for like I'll use a lot of whole sets for foxes. Yeah, okay, yep. Or young dogs. Whereas I haven't had a lot of success on a whole set with older dogs for some reason. Yeah. So and then as, obviously you can't use like a, a trail set where there's kangaroos going through and all that right. sort of stuff like that, which is where the camera comes into play there. Yeah, a camera and just sort of reading your your ads and stuff like that to make sure you know, it's like a scent post set. A lot of the time dogs will, you know, urinate on, on trees and things like that. Um, where you could pro possibly put a trap on, but you've just got to make sure that there's no koalas or possums and things like that using that tree as well. Yeah. Um, before you go and put a set there, but that'd be like a scent post set where a dog would naturally urinate on or or mark <clears throat> their territory on. Yeah. Um, then there's like a flat set, which is you just basically use a um, any sort of backing, what we call backing. So. Um, you want whenever you're setting a trap, you imagine this is a tussock in the in the on the side of a track. Yep. You want to use what we call backing. So the idea of that is you put your trap in front of it. Yeah. So then when the dog approaches it, he can't approach from this side. So you want you want to put your lure at the base of that backing. Yeah. So so that they always approach the the backing from the front. Yeah. So they oh, essentially you need them to walk into the trap. Yeah. As they go and just sniff the item. And I yeah. guess that's something I didn't understand when I first was looking at it. I, I thought that um, you caught them on the back leg. So they oh, walked up and they stood there to cock their leg and they stand in the trap with their back leg. Yeah. I didn't, I never realized that it was like that they stand with their front foot as they leaned in to sniff the first, sniff yeah. the tree. And so when I've seen all these front leg traps, I was going, oh man, they keep accidentally getting the wrong leg. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's a lot better to catch a dog on the front leg. Sometimes you do accidentally catch them on the back leg. Um, but they, they have a lot more chance of like, pulling, pulling the, loose yeah. pulling loose when they're caught by the back leg. Yeah, they've got a lot more leverage. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, well, let's, let's, let's quickly touch on, um, on shooting dogs. Yeah. Um, what's the best gun, the best calibre? Oh, mate, I don't, <laughs> I don't really know, to be honest. There's... You know, I'm personally I'm not really much of a gun nut, so to speak. I've got I've got three guns that I just use, and that's all I use. So I use a um, a 22 for when I'm just shooting rabbits or something like that to, to yep. harvest for the meat. Um, I'll use a 22 Magnum for dogs in a trap. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> and then most of the time I carry just a 22 250, which is my favourite gun. Um, well, that's that's gun. what I. That's what I believed was the uh, the go to dog gun was the twenty two two fifty. So I'm not surprised yeah. you said that. But yeah, no, I just got a um, an old twenty two two fifty that I bought years ago that I've just always loved. Um, it's just a synthetic stock gun, you know, cheapo um, that I just carry around with me everywhere I go. It comes with me. It doesn't matter if I scratch it up. I just yeah. make sure it's in inside, obviously, and. Um, and what do you got a three to nine times on the top or? Yeah, yeah, just to stand. It's a it's actually a good scope. That is one thing I do spend a bit of it. So it's a Leopold scope. Yep. Um, because one thing with with shooting dogs is you don't wanna um miss or hit the dog badly. You know, once again it just comes down to ethical things. I yep. I'm a big believer in shoot when you're hundred percent confident you're gonna kill the dog first shot. Yeah. So I make sure that all my guns are you know, in sight and spot shooting on. Yeah. straight. Yeah. And so you got a large objective on the front of that scope or is it just a normal sort of 40 mil or you're not sure? Yeah, yeah, just a normal 40 mil. Yeah, yeah okay. So you're not yeah. shooting in much low light then? It's mostly no, not really. Daylight. Yeah, the, the, when we're howling, so it'll be fairly low light. But once again, um, when they're calling dogs, if you're in a good spot, as long as the wind's right, you can get them in pretty close. You can get them close enough, you know. I don't shoot anything sort of over 200 yards. I'll make yep. sure that they're closer than that before I even attempt to shoot them. Um, as I said, I'm not sort of out there to sort of try and prove anything. I'm just trying to get a job done. So, yeah. Um, so when you to... when you are when you are shooting them and howling them in, yeah, are you better off on the on the ridges or down in the valleys or is it a so, bit of everything? <clears throat> bit of everything, but um, a lot of the time, once again, the old fellas sort of that I learn off. Um, used to say that obviously dogs when they're hunting they'll be down on the flats so overnight they'll be down on the flats so yep. if you're calling in the morning you should be up in the hill or on a ridge 
Yes, okay. If you're, calling, if you're calling overnight, you should be down in the flats because that's where the dog's naturally going to be travelling anyway. So of an afternoon, they'll be travelling back up into the into the hill. So that's where you, you call from. Yep. And of a morning, you're down in the flats. So, yeah. So they're camping up in the hills in the night? Is Yeah, that's the idea. So when they when you hear them howling at night, carrying on and all that, is that yeah. just is that just the young ones misbehaving, or is that them trying oh. to do the things in as well? Or? Yeah, a bit of everything. They communicate as well, so they'll communicate between packs as well, just to find out, you know, if a packs in the area, they'll the they'll do a few calls just to see how many other dogs are around. Um, like. Once again, there's different types of howls as well. So they'll they'll be like a playful howl where they're only mucking around and calling out, or often you'll hear them calling out to like an ambulance or an aeroplane and things yeah. like that, because that's just a natural instinct for them. They think that's another dog howling, so they'll have a howl back. No, well, that's um, the the guy that took me out. He his howl sounded a lot like an ambulance. He goes, oh, "I've been told it sounds like an ambulance." He goes, "But it works." <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. do you use electronic callers at all, or just um, I haven't had a lot of experience with electronic callers. Trent's got one and he swears by it, but I like the fact that I can actually call a dog with my own voice, you know, like, and I think it's a bit of an art and you get more, much more of a thrill out of it than I do anyway. Of course. You know? So are you sort of putting the hands up to your mouth and calling out or have you got a, uh, like a megaphone or something? Yeah, no, I tried. I actually got an old buffalo horn that I used to call through yeah and it does definitely give you a bit of a different tone yeah um but lumping all this gear around you know sometimes you walk for two or three kilometers before you find a decent spot so i just carry my gun and just use my hands yeah yeah okay so when, when you say a decent spot you like of an afternoon you're up on the ridge yep. trying to call them up out and so obviously you're just trying no, to get no, the the position. Other way so oh, down, yeah. of an afternoon you're down in the gullies down in the yeah. okay in the gully yeah. And so you just try and get in a position where obviously you're downwind of where you think they are. Yeah. And you'll try and get just the best visibility of, of them coming in from anywhere. Yeah. And a bit of a open area between you and where, where you think they might come out of. Just so okay. you get the best yeah. possible chance to, to get a shot on them. Yeah. Um, like I've been in an area where the dogs have been, you know, 10 metres away from me and I can't see them. You know, they're howling, but you physically can't see them there, you know, so, and what they do then is, is a dog will all the time chase the wind to try and catch your wind before he approaches too closely. If yep. he can't see whatever he's hearing, he'll swing around. So yeah, you've lost them in terms of the end. So you just got to have a bit of an area where you can physically see them before you, they um, come in too close. And are you full camoed up doing this? Yeah. So I've just got a, um, like a it's sort of like a leafy top that I put on. Um, once again, everyone's got their own sort of way of doing it. Like I, you, I'm more. Sometimes I'll just use that as like a bit of a blind in front of me as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, and have have some sort of backing behind me. I used to try and sort of get behind stuff, um, but then I was finding that I was going to shoot something and there'd be something in my way, you know. Uh, like a branch or a bit of lantana or something in my way. So now I actually sit in front of that and just use my thing as a bit of a blind with that behind me, with, yeah. you know, a bush or something behind me. Yeah, well, that's so what the, that's the big one I heard is you've got to break your silhouette. Yeah. You know, like sitting on top of a ridge, just a dead giveaway. Yeah. It's always come in just down off the ridge. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's pretty cool. Um, and so you prefer shooting them of an evening as opposed to in the morning? Is there a specific, you just can't get up in the morning? <laughs> no, no, it's not that. I think I, I personally like the morning a bit better because you've got a bigger window of time of time frame of when, you know, dogs will be traveling around. So dogs, you know, nine times out of 10 will travel, you know, a lot more just obviously just after daylight through to a sort of 10 o'clock. <clears throat> and you've just got that, couple more hours whereas yep. of a night you've only got that shorter window of until you can't see anymore you know um, yeah okay oh yeah yeah of course so basically I... yeah so the morning i just prefer the morning a bit more because it's sort of um yeah you get those couple more hours yeah okay and so then you sort of 
So when you say the morning, what are you hunting up to like nine thirty? Yeah, maybe ten o'clock or ten o'clock, something like that. Yeah, and then and, start and, go and, setting your traps. Yeah, so yeah, go, sorry, going back to that, that was the reason why we would hail of an afternoon because first thing in the morning we'd be out checking traps, um, or setting oh, traps. Yeah, okay. yeah, and then we'd be hailing in the afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because obviously you want to try and do most of that in the cool of the day as well. It's not yeah. possible. Yeah, exactly. And it's better for the dogs, you know, if you get there first thing in the morning. A lot oh, of get them out of the heat and that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, you, so are they are they mostly on the move at night? Is that when you find that they're yeah mainly. doing most of, most of their stuff? So they keep yeah. down during the day. Yeah, a lot of the time. Um, a lot of the time, if it's overcast, showery days, they'll they'll be travelling around as well as well, and sometimes you would just see out of the blue a dog traveling through the heat of the day as well but it all once again there's so many variables to it there's never a real set rule but most of the time they are normally traveling around of the night they're hunting of the night um and then sleeping through the day yeah okay so have you had much success like walking up on them sleeping during the day or it's like not really a thing that can be done i mean because the one that I, I, I came across one, the first wild dog I've ever seen, the only one I've ever seen at this point was, it was sleeping behind a water trough. I've never seen something move so quick in my life. It was faster yeah. than the emu. It that's was a, so quick. That's the problem with trying to walk up on them. Um, by the time you see them, it's usually too late. They're gone, you know, yeah. and they're, they're so fast. Um, like I've definitely walked up on a couple of dogs, like stalking deer and pigs and stuff like that. Walked up and there's been a dog there, but, by the time you sort of get out ready to shot, they're, they're gone. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, definitely, definitely um, I just find it easier if I can see them coming towards me rather than trying to sneak up on them. Yeah, because obviously you've got the time to, to prepare yourself. Well, you're ready before they are. Yeah. As opposed to them being ready before you are. Yeah. So yeah. that's obviously the ultimate goal. Yeah, exactly. And same spotlighting, like I've had mixed results with people spotlighting and stuff as well, like being spotlighting for other pigs or something and then come across a dog and being able to shoot it. A lot of the time I've found you try and spotlight and dogs will hear you for miles and just clear off, you know, um, yeah. or see the light or whatever themselves and just move off. But, um, yeah, there's, yeah, that's why, once again, why I enjoy doing it because they're, they're always different. And what would you enjoy more? Do you enjoy getting one in a trap? Or you enjoy howling one in? Oh, that's a hard. That's a hard question. Or is that like saying, do you prefer a hot pizza versus a cold pizza? It's just a different type of pizza. Yeah, it is. It is. There's. I have. I have to say, like, being able to catch it, like, just for instance, if even if you're on a ten acre property, yep. to be able to get a dog to put its foot on something about that big in ten ten acres. You know, it takes a bit of skill. So that well, part to, to of put it, something that big on a dog is probably pretty good skill too. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but the the feeling that you get when you catch a dog in a trap is is pretty pretty good feeling. But being able to howl a dog in with your own voice and and being able to be able to shoot it is is probably yeah my favourite. Well, it's funny you say that because I I went out the last time I went hunting just. Before, uh, before after Christmas went out to Burke this was on that place that the guy got the, all those dogs and we were just like randomly walking through the bush and I remember standing there and I looked down and there was like uh, this little tiny old school beer bottle cap and I just thought what's the chances of me jumping off my bike standing here looking down and seeing that yeah and I guess it's the same thing to to get a dog in all that country to put its foot on a little tiny thing is yeah almost near impossible not when obviously the whole idea is to get them in with a lure and all that still but there's so many variables to to make oh, that yeah. happen it's incredible yeah and it happens a bit you know you'll do everything right 100 percent right and the dog will come in the way you wanted it to and it'll step this far away from your pen you know because yep, you, you see the print <laughs> yeah and you don't catch it you just think oh you know so close but yeah is okay, a, well, what would you say is easier, do you think? If, say, me, new to, new guy, do you think it's more likely I can how one in and shoot it yeah. or trap it? I think 
I think during the breeding season or, or leading up to Christmas, you're definitely more, um, you've got more chance of, of howling or calling a dog in, especially with the electronic callers, um, than trapping a dog. But once again, there's lots of um, silly young dogs around that just will go for any sort of smell and just tread all around until they eventually put their foot in the trap as well. Yeah, yeah okay. That'll be um, interesting to see if I can howl one before I trap one. That's yeah. Um, yeah. It's gonna be and, and how many traps are you sort of putting in? I mean, obviously it's very property dependent, but yeah. Is it sort of the more the better or no not really. It's um it's being able to find the right spots and, and once again it depends on the amount of dogs in an area. Like I've never i I've never been worked on an area where there's been more than um ten dogs in one area, you know, where I've been working. Yeah. Um, because that's what we find on the cameras, you know, so really you probably only need 10 traps. Um, but we would put like in that set, in that case, we'll put it, probably put 50 traps out, you know? Okay. So, well, let's give us, give us your best trapping story. I want either, I don't know whether it's the most dogs you pulled off of a single set yep. or the most dogs you pulled out of uh, a week or just the funniest trapping stuff. Like, give me, give me one or two of your okay. favourite trapping moments. Um, it could be unsuccessful. That doesn't, that doesn't bother me. I think yeah, yeah, cool. yeah. Probably, probably um, the best, like my most memorable trapping um, experiences when Trent and I first started out, um, you know, and just trying to bit, make a bit of a name for yourself and things like that. We had a farmer approach us and he was basically, you know, a pretty big, strong, tough farmer guy. And he was nearly in tears about these dogs coming in and eating these 600 kilo heifers, you know, like fully grown heifers. Yeah. Um, and he basically come to us and said straight out, if you can't do anything about it, I'm going to get out of cattle. I've tried everything, you know, and we're able to go in there and, um, and successfully trap these pack of dogs. I think we end up catching five or six or something like that and basically fixed his problem, you know? And that was, a, that was probably the most, you know, memorable one for me that it was over a couple of weeks. Um, but we eventually got the, the, the main pack of the dogs and fixed his problem, you know, and that was a bloke that was going to totally get out of cattle. So, well, it's, it's funny you say that because I sort of called my, my brand is called black dog trapping. Oh yeah. So, um, and I don't know if you know, but black dog is a term used for depression. Yeah. And yeah. so that was what I'd heard was that, you know, that the, um, the wild dogs were causing huge amounts of depression with the sheep oh, farmers yeah. and that. So it's kind of my, the name I come up with was a bit of a two edged sword as like stop depression and stop the dogs. Yeah. 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 So, no, it could make sense because they do. It's a, and once again, the people that don't understand, should read stories about you know that sort of effect that the dogs have on farmers you know like i've been in areas where farmers haven't been able to even have like they tried having cattle or tried having sheep sorry to start off with dogs decimated the yep. sheep so they couldn't have sheep so they went to cattle the dogs decimated the cattle so they went to you know have cropping or something and just having a family pet and then the dogs would come in and smash their family pets you know well, I think that's something that people don't appreciate too either. Like, um, like if you go out St. George, it's nearly all cattle country because they can't keep sheep because the dogs are just too thick and too strong. Yeah. The other thing people probably don't appreciate is, is the dogs just kill for fun. Yeah, They absolutely. do literally get stuck into it. And, you know, you hear stories of people losing like 13 sheep to one dog in one night and they're not yeah. getting eaten. They're just getting killed. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, that's so. exactly right. Um, that's what they do. They'll, they'll attack something like a sheep or a calf or even a cow um, until it's no more fun, until it stops moving and then they'll move on to the next one, you know, because there's no more fun in that. So they just move on to the next one. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's it's devastating and it really is, you know, it's heartbreaking when you go onto farms like that that have lost, you know, a big part of their livelihood because of these dogs that have come in and just decimated them, you know. And what do you think's the the biggest contributor to the wild dogs? Do you think it's people 
letting pets go or is it just literally just a number of dingoes and hybrids that are just keep breeding on and on and on or or do you think there there is numbers getting pushed in from human populations to be honest i don't really know um I, I don't know if it is because of people letting their dogs go. Um, it might have been originally a, a big factor in it, but these days, you know, from my experience, I'll find that people have let their dogs go or dogs have gotten away, and nine times out of ten, they'll be they'll will find them dead because the wild dogs will kill them. Okay, so it's not like you're out there finding, <clears throat> you know, great danes or or leftover pig dogs. It's they're literally all, you know, red dogs or red Most, dog variants. Yeah, yeah. The majority of them have got dingo in their bloodlines. Yeah. Um, okay. Every now and then you'll find a, yeah, a, like a um, pig dog type dog that's still running around with a pack of wild dogs or something like that. But it's very rare um, yeah, to okay. find that. Um, Not with a <clears> chest <throat> plate still on it? No. No, <laughs> lot, I've never, touch would never actually seen that. But, um, Definitely, yeah, some pig dogs that have been running wild for a couple of years that, um, you know, were causing massive problems on farms that we found. So, yeah, yeah, um, you know, and you could tell that they were running wild for a couple of years just by their their whole... Um, mannerism, yeah. Mannerism and the, the condition that they were in. And, yeah, it's... Um, yeah, they're pretty scary animals when they get like that, that's for sure. They basically revert back to the you know, the, the wild dog. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, that's, I think I saw this fantastic, machines. I saw this thing on YouTube that they were, they got um, some dingoes, some purebred dingoes. They bred them in pens, fed them just dog food. And the, they grew this pup up and it had never seen kangaroos, never seen anything. And then they took that, that pup when it was a grown dog and they went and placed it in this sanctuary in like South Australia or something where, where there's like kangaroos and all that to try and put this dog back in there. And yep. that's it within 45 minutes, it ran down a kangaroo and killed it. Yeah. <laughs> that's like, they just, people don't Some understand that that's the instinct of these, these animals is to, yeah. to do that. Something and it's no different. It, they got to chase it. It's no different to domestic dogs, you know, like they've just got that natural instinct to chase things as well. So um, yeah. that's why they chase balls. You know, that's, that's their natural instinct coming out in them. They're, they're, you know, um, hunting something down for their pack leader, basically, and bringing it back to them. You know, it's no different to a wild dog killing something for their pack leader. So, yeah. yeah. What, what is that you've got hanging beside you on your, the other side? Yeah. Yeah. Is that a wind chime or something? Yeah, yeah. My wife's very artistic. So she, that's actually made out of um, some sort of bones. I was going to say, it looks like literally slivers of bones, like big yeah. bone or something. They're out of some sort of backbone, slivers of backbone, that one, there. Yeah. yeah, there's also, oh man, this, just have a bit of a look. Look up in the, look at the roof, like. Oh, wow. They're all umbrellas. Yeah, That's she's quite, got, she's got a fair bit going on there. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little a, pleasurable space, though, to be in. Is that what it you is, think? yeah. Do you do any reloading or you just buy factories? Um, my um, stepfather actually reloads oh, all, my, all my stuff for me, which is very good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's um, he's very good at it. He does a lot of shooting too, so yeah, he does that. So I just every time I'm down there, I'll just take my empties down and and he tops uh, them up for you. Tops them up. Yeah, it's pretty good like that. Works well. Um, good little system. Yeah, yeah. And as I said, like I'm, I'm not a gun nut, so I just use whatever he's using at the time and whatever it says he's. He's saying it's working for him. I'll just, I'll just use it and make sure it's shooting straight and go from there. Yep, just do a bit of a recite <clears throat> and go for gold. Yeah, fair yeah. enough. All right. Well, I think that's um, I think it's covered pretty much everything I wanted to to talk about. Is there anything that um you wanted to to say or or anything like that before we? Not wrap really, it up? mate. No, I think we've sort of yeah covered a lot of things, touched on a lot of things anyway. Um, oh, I don't think yeah, I, I think. Oh, there's too many things I want to know. So it's like, I'm just quite trying to get a little taste of everything, but yeah, yeah. I yeah. guess it's, um, it's been good. So yeah, but definitely, um, if you're interested in coming out, you know, or, um, spend a bit of time together and 
I can help you out a bit more, just let me know. I'd be keen. Yeah, to mate, of... I would be, I'd love to come and tag along and just like watch over your shoulder. Yeah, yeah. I scent all over your traps. And... <laughs> <laughs> the hardest bit is obviously, you know, a lot of properties with insurance and things like that. But um, yeah, I've got some pretty good mates with, with a bit of ground and we can sort of, you know, work on. So um, yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm all for sort of, that's one thing I think, you know, a lot more people should be giving, you know, helping other people with their knowledge rather than what it used to be, you know. When I was first starting out, um, you know, as a kid trying to learn about it, it was very hard to, to get someone to show you because it was almost like a secret, you know, sick, you know, it's all your little tricks and that's it, you know. So I'm all for trying to help as many people as I can doing it the right way rather than just giving them a trap and saying, there you go, go and put it in. Well, and because at the end of the day, I think, and, and I, we talked briefly over this over the phone, is that um, uh, if someone unsuccessfully traps a dog, it makes it much harder to catch it again later. And that's yeah. what you're about, making sure it gets done right the first time. That's right. Exactly. So... All right, Chris, I think um, I think we'll wrap it up there. Now, I normally say at the end of my videos, I say, um, you know, I always tell them, you know, make sure that they hit the big subscribe button in the middle here, or there's also that little uh, one down the corner that's there in the whole video. And uh, make sure they smash that knockout bell so they get notified of the next video and uh, give us a big thumbs up. And if you've got any questions, hit us below. And then I say something like, you know, get them big boars, get out there, have fun, get in the sun. <laughs> And until next time, catch you later. What do you want to say to, to the viewers and to the listeners? Um, yeah, check it, check us out on YouTube. If you've got any other questions or anything, put them in the comments and um, I'd be happy, as I said, to help as many people out as I can. So, And uh, um, it, 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 what's the channel called? It's a Dogger's Life? It's a Dogger's Life on YouTube, yeah. yeah. Yep. And um, are you on Facebook and Instagram as well? Yeah, on Facebook, just under Chris Booby. Um, I have got It's a Dog's Life um, channel, whatever it's called, on, on Facebook as well, or page that yep. I've just started going, um, sort of being a little bit more active with. It's not something that I've all been right into because of the time that it takes, you know, to do all that sort of social media stuff. It sort of takes your, your time away from when you are at home, away from you a little bit. Yeah, um, like I've done wife. to you tonight, taking you two hours yeah, that's, from your wife. That's all, right. <laughs> that's all right, it's only once. But yeah, I, I just found, that, you know, you're sitting down and having a bit of quality time and as soon as someone walked out of the room, you jump onto social media and scroll through, you know. So I just try not to do that as much, but I'm, I'm trying to be a little bit more active these days just to be able to help a few more people out. So Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I've, I've tried to put my phone down a bit more in the last couple of months. So, cause it's very easy at the moment with this coronavirus, being at home to be just like on the phone the whole time. But yeah, it's, um, it's, I've got a, I've got a little bit of an excuse at the moment because I've got some um, pig traps set. So I've got the SMS camera set up on them. Um, it didn't send you any messages while we've been talking, did it? It did. It sent me one, but that was the outside camera. It was just a cow walking past, I think. So ah, no. It's good. all good. It's all good. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, so you got to monitor that. So you sort of have to have your phone on you a little bit. But, um, oh, you know, there's a pig there. There's one pig there. Yeah, he's not, they haven't gone in yet. But yeah, but that's... So is that, a, is that a remote a remote set trap, is it? Like you can yeah. push the button on it? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. that'd be cool. Yeah, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> All right. No okay, thanks very much for your time, Chris. Really appreciate it. And um, like I said, until next time, I'll catch you later and have a good one. Thank you very much. All right, let me stop the recording. I'll just stop this one. And I'll just stop this one here as well.